Hi there. So, if you've been watching through this Sanctuary System series from the beginning, then I think this is the ninth video you've watched, and I thank you. You're well on your way to becoming a tech Jedi for our church. This video is especially important since we are going to be talking about how to operate our mixer, the Soundcraft UI24R. Now, maybe you just stumbled onto this video looking for information about the UI24 mixer. If so, this might be worth watching because I'll be talking about some real world basics. I'm not gonna get into the musical or creative side of mixing, that is a whole other topic. I'm just gonna talk about how to run the mixer for a typical Sunday morning. Now, like I said in the last video, the main thing that makes these Soundcraft UI mixers unusual, if you're used to a traditional or analog mixer, is the fact that there's no console. The mixer itself is a big brick backstage, and the console is essentially just a web page that is hosted by the mixer. So any device that can open an HTML5 website can run the mixer, and it's especially suited to large touchscreen um, or tablet-like devices. And because the mixer is doing all the processing, the device doesn't have to be very fast or fancy. At our church, we use a 10-inch Amazon Fire tablet because I wanted us to have a dedicated device um, for the purpose, and it was cheap. But I also use my own iPad Pro sometimes, and once I even just use my iPhone. Now, I touched on this way back in video 104, but it's worth going over again here. The tablet is connected to the mixer over the mixer's own Wi-Fi signal. Now, I'm not gonna put the lock screen passcode in this public video, but if you need it, you'll have it. Once unlocked, the tablet should automatically connect to the mixer's Wi-Fi if the mixer is on. Uh, but if not, or if it doesn't connect, you wanna make sure that the tablet is set to the network called Soundcraft UI24. If you can browse the internet on the tablet, then you are not on the right network. The tablet connects to the mixer, not to the internet. Okay, so the mixer interface is in a Google Chrome tab. In other words, if you don't see the mixer interface on the tablet, don't go looking for a mixer app, just launch Chrome. And if it's not already loaded, type ui-mixer.io into the address bar. That will load the device selection screen where you can choose the large screen option. And that should take you into the mixer interface. Okay, so this is the interface. As you see, there are a lot of faders, but don't let it intimidate you. One of the great things about digital mixers like this is that we have already pre-configured a lot of things so that there's actually not a lot for you, the volunteer, to worry about during the service. I know that I'm always gonna be trying to improve our sound, but whatever changes I make are saved in the mixer. So the information in this video should remain relevant and accurate, even if I've tweaked things under the hood, so to speak. So first, a quick overview of the interface layout. Up at the top, there's a set of buttons that are always there. These help navigate between various views. In the middle is the main window. This can show all sorts of things, but by default, it shows the faders. On the right is the master fader and another set of buttons. These buttons control a lot of really useful things, and we'll come back to this later for sure. Okay, so let's go through those top navigation buttons in more detail. First, this button on the upper left will give you a graphic overview of all the meters, in and out. This can be handy if you're trying to quickly diagnose a squealing channel or something. You can tap on a channel and it will automatically bring you back to the main mixing view with that channel highlighted. The button is also a way to access these other tabs. As a beginner, the Views tab is the only one that you'll really ever use, but we'll come back to that again later. Okay, going back to the top, the next button is the Mix Gain button. If you're ever lost, press that button and it will bring you back to the main mixing view. If you're already in the main mixing view, that button will take you to a reddish gain setting view. But just press it again and you're back to the main mix view. The next button across the top is the Edit button. This is where the true power of the mixer comes in. But unless you really know what you're doing, just skip it. And if you find yourself in an edit view, then press the mix gain button to go back to the main mix view. Next, we have the aux sends and effects sends buttons. The aux sends are really a big part of understanding our mixing system, but they can be a little confusing. So we'll dive deeper into that in the next video. But for now, just know that the aux sends control the mix that is going to our live stream as well as the mixes that are going to the monitors for the band. 
The effects sends button shows how much of each channel is being sent to each of the four effects buses. And if the phrase effects bus sounds like just an uncomfortable way to watch reruns of Justified, then you'll know why I'm telling you to just ignore this button. We've already set things up in the effects sends to work the way that they need to work, so you don't have to worry about it. Next up is the playback button. This button opens a menu showing the audio files that you can play back. However, since we're using ProPresenter as the source for all of our audio for playback, we actually don't need to use this feature very much. So we can move along to the last navigation button, which is the settings gear. As you can see, there are a ton of settings that can be customized, but please just leave this alone. It's worth noting that one of the tabs is called Shows, and that's where I save snapshots, which is kind of like a save file for the mixer. But I'm actually not sure if the settings are saved in the snapshot, so probably best to just leave the settings and Shows alone. All right, let's talk about the side panel a bit. By default, it's set to always be visible in mix mode but you can hide it and show it with the UI button on the top right. There are three tabs that control what you see at the top of the slide out. I just leave it on the player tab so that we have easy access to the record button. This starts and stops a stereo recording of the main mix, which is how we usually record the sermon. The recordings are stored on a thumb drive in the mixer, which can be pulled out after the service and plugged into the computer to upload the sermon recordings. Just note that the record button you should use is the lower one. The upper one, marked MTK, is the multi-track record, which records raw audio from multiple channels, but we don't typically use that. Okay, below these controls, there is a column of blue view groups and a column of red mute groups. The mute groups allow you to mute a bunch of channels at once. So for example, pressing the mute band mute group uh, will mute all the instruments and mics of the worship team. So I usually keep this mute group active for the whole sermon. The view groups are extremely handy. The default mix has almost 50 faders, but the view groups allow us to set up specific views that only show certain channels and faders. You can click these to see some of the various views that I've already set up. But the most important view is the top one, and it's just labeled custom because it can change every week. If you're running sound, then I encourage you to set up this view group however you want. Here's how. Press and hold the view group button. That will bring up a window showing all the input channels that you can assign to the view group. The highlighted channels are what will show up in the view group. And the number in the corner indicates in what order it will be. So for example, on a typical Sunday, I will start fresh by clearing all the selected channels in the custom view group. Then I'll think about what channels are going to be used today and how I would like to see them. I know the pastor will be preaching, so maybe I'll start with that channel. Then I'll add one of the Mac channels, which is a stereo pair of channels coming from the computer, but I only need to see one of the channels to control the level of both. Maybe we have three singers, piano, guitar, bass, and drums. So now when I go to the mix view and tap on the view group, I'll only see the faders I selected and in the order I selected them. Mute groups can be set up in much the same way. Press and hold, then set the channels you want to be affected by the group. However, we've already set up most of the handy mute groups, so it's probably a good idea to just leave those as they are. Okay, let's talk about the faders in the main window. Each one is labeled, so you can easily tell what's what. Operating the faders works just like you'd expect. Tap, hold, and slide. If you feel like your hands are getting in the way, you can even move your finger to the side while you're holding to get a better view. Also, if you tap and hold still on the fader for a couple seconds, the fader will glow blue and give you a very precise control over the level. The faint blue line on the faders shows the post gain level. That's the input level of the source set in the reddish gain view. The bright yellow orange line is the output level of the channel. That's the main thing you need to pay attention to. The faders control and show source levels, but they can also show and control output levels, such as the master fader on the side. But there are also master faders for our aux channels as well. You can see those by tapping the aux masters button. Again, we'll talk more about um, the aux channels in the next video. One last but important thing to touch on is subgroups and VCAs. 
They're both ways to group multiple sources to a single fader. I won't go into all the differences in this video, but just know that we're not really using subgroups right now. Any mixing professionals out there will say that we're missing out on a lot of possibilities by doing that, and I get it, but the reality is VCAs are a lot easier to understand, so we're sticking with that for now. A VCA is basically a master fader for a group of channels. We use VCAs for our vocals and our drums. So how do we use this? Well, for example, we can set the mix between the individual singers, like usual, and then be able to bring the overall level of all the vocalists up or down with one fader, our vocal VCA fader. If you're looking at a VCA in one of our views, for example, drums here, to see the individual channels, press the spill button. That'll bring up all the channels in the VCA. And if you want to go back, just press the close button, and that will bring you back to your previous view. Okay, that's it for the basics. It might seem like a lot, but it's actually quite easy once you get the hang of the interface. So on a typical morning, Sunday morning, all you'll have to do is this. One, pay attention during rehearsal, get as many levels set as possible. Adjust the Mac audio of the pre-service music. Adjust the band levels during the service as needed. At the end of the worship set, mute the band and unmute the pastor. Adjust the pastor's mic if needed and start the sermon recording. At the end of the sermon, stop the sermon recording and unmute the band again. And you can mute the pastor. After the closing worship, mute the band again during our video announcements, unmute the pastor for the benediction, and then finally adjust the post-service background music levels as needed. So watch through this video a few times and let me know when you feel comfortable giving the mixer a try. Or I may just spring it on you, and I'm sorry if I do that. You can also go to this link. It's also in the description. Um, and basically there you can use an online demo of the interface just to get familiar with, uh, with it without having to actually be at church. Anyway, thanks for watching. See you next time.